Okay, the meeting's called to order at 5.32. Hearing session, this is the portion of our meeting designated for comments from the public about matters related to the closed session agenda. Comments are limited to three minutes with a maximum of 20 minutes allocated for a particular item or topic. To address the governing board, please submit to the clerk of the board a completed speaker card prior to the start of the closed session portion of the meeting. Mr. Fazelva. We do not have any cards. All right, we will adjourn to closed session at 5.33.
All right, so we will return from closed section at, I had to do this for everything, 6.02 and reconvene into open session. Public report of action taken in closed section, section no action taken. The flag salute this evening will be led by our infused student, Sophia Carboni. Good evening, board members, cabinet, and community members. My name is Sophia Carboni, and I am a sixth grader, a sixth grade student from Live Oak Elementary School. We will begin tonight's meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Will you please stand for the flag salute? Place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. My name is James Curtis, and I'm a third grade student at Live Book Elementary. We are excited to share a few great moments from last week's super summer camp at San Onofre School. and James. <laughs> Wonderful job, first of all. Yeah, but we're gonna, I'm gonna give you your certificates and then take pictures with the board members. Good job. That's the hardest part. Closing for the page. The hardest part was me. Like looking at another one, and it looks like I'm just like not looking for the Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. High five him on the way out. <laughs> All right, we move to approve the minutes of the June 5th, 2023 regular meeting. It is recommended the governing board approve the minutes of the June 5th, 2023 regular meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? A motion to approve. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Call for the vote. <clears throat> Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Mr. Favela? Aye. Ms. McBride? Aye. And I vote aye as well. So approve. 
that moves us to the hearing session. This is the portion of our meeting designated for comments from the board about matters not on the agenda, but within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Should individuals wish to comment on items on the present agenda, they may do so during this portion of the meeting or at the time the item is considered by the board. Comments are limited to three minutes with a maximum of 20 minutes allocated for a particular item or topic. While the Brown Act allows the board to hear issues within its jurisdiction from the public that are not on the agenda, it only allows the board to respond in a very limited manner, such as providing direction to staff. If the board were to have more than this type of brief discussion on an item not on the agenda, it could be a violation of the Brown Act's rules for posting the agenda. To address the governing board, please submit to the clerk of the board a completed speaker card prior to the start of the open session portion of the meeting. And Mr. Favell, I'm sure we have cards. Thank we you. We have a couple. Um, and we'll start with Russ Speckley. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, Russ Beckley, I live uh, aboard Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, you, Cindy, for being so responsive in your emails. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Um, and I really want to talk about representation uh, right now because I feel like it's almost a halfway constitutional crisis that I feel like I'm in uh, as a, a service member um, who does not have the right to vote. Um, however, there are, are officials who are not elected who make decisions that impact my family, okay? Uh, and really what I kind of want to do is, is just address the board members. Um, Ms. Balch, uh, within your area, you have 700, at least 700 uh, military affiliated kids. Okay. And I really want you to take that to heart and understand how important it is to us military members that we feel like we have representation, right? So that when our kids go to school, they're learning math, science, history, uh, and then just leave the social stuff to the parents right? Everybody has the right to raise their kids the way that they want to. And I truly believe that. But uh, there are certain topics that I feel like it's my job as a father uh, to, to teach them or to guide them through. Um, uh, Ms. London, uh, you are area two, which is my area. 500 military kids go to San Onofre Elementary School, my kids included. Again, please, I ask you to take uh, our community uh, you know, um, to heart when you're voting on this board and understand that us military uh, parents are extremely busy. We have a lot of challenges. This is my 11-year-old's 10th school here. Uh, and it's always so great, uh, usually when I move around the military, because for one, my kids are resilient. I wish they could stay in one school, but that's just not the life that we live. But they join a culture that is universal amongst the military, especially amongst Marines. It always makes me feel good. And I want to keep that culture intact for my kids. Um, uh, uh, Dr. McCray, you are the president of the board. And I ask you, please, again, take the military community here uh, and, and allow us to have some value, right? I can't vote, but I ask you to understand that we are valued members of the community and we care deeply for our children. Uh, and lastly, uh, Mr. Favela, right? Uh, everybody has their rights and I would never say anything bad about different people, right? But I will tell you, perspective is everything. And the fact that you don't say the pledge, it, it bothers me, especially because I know there are military kids within your district, right? And that flag means a lot to me and it means a lot to them. We were at war for over 20 years. I wonder how many times a mother found out that her husband died. And those kids could be going to your school and when they take the flag off this coffin and they fold it and hand it to that mother, that means something. And I ask you please to show it as due respect. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you for that. Next we have Michael or Mitchell, I'm not sure. Greetings board members. Um, Obviously, last week, I found out how quick three minutes once standing up here, and I did not get to finish my remarks. Um, the remarks I was able to make, there was an elderly lady in the gallery who uh, made a characterization of the remarks that I was able to get out that were inaccurate. So I just want to clarify right now to Mr. Favela, um, if you took, as she did, my remarks as an attack for what you are not doing, or what I tried to indicate, you know, show bearing Part of your oath says, I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. 
and how that is not mutually exclusive from the Pledge of Allegiance, I was not attacking you. My intent, though while I know I can tend to speak in a very direct and a very convicted manner, especially things that I've supported as a way of life, it can come off that way. But my intent was to edify and admonish. And none of those have a negative connotation. I know admonish isn't a word a lot of people use, but it simply means to urge or help somebody understand something that was forgotten or to encourage them in a positive manner. Now, again, I know my speaking manner doesn't always convey that, but my true intent was to edify and admonish in a positive way. Um, again, I just think there's some things in our country we all should have a collective, simple perspective towards the Pledge of Allegiance. That flag is a symbol of our country worldwide. There's nobody racing to get into the other 192 countries in this world the way they're coming to get here. So though we got things we need to work on, we're still doing it better than everybody else. And things like the pledge are something we should have collective agreement on, a simple act. Kids say it every day in the school classrooms, the young ones in K through, in, in K through five and the old middle ones and the older ones. It's just a symbol. And it's also modeling the oath that you took here. I just don't think it's appropriate or it's um, a good thing to model or to not model something that you, that, you, that you take an oath. That's part of an oath. Again, they're not mutually exclusive. Your oath and saying the Pledge of Allegiance to that symbol of our nation. Thank you. And that's it for this part of the agenda. All right. That moves us to reports from the board. Anybody would like to volunteer? Or we can just get down the. I don't have anything to report. Um, well, school ended. So we're in the middle of uh, the start of our summer. So, um, so uh, I know the summer school program is also continued. So uh, we're not missing a B on that. So, but we're excited about that as well. Um, something that I did learn was uh, that apparently it's not too late to call the school to clear absences. Uh, so I encourage parents if uh, if uh, I know it's been a rough year. I know my in my home um, we're still you know transitioning out of the COVID stage where um, you know you know kids stay home if they have a cop and always erring on that side. So I know we have some absences to clear. And it just helps our school in the wrong run. So we're not, it's not too late to report absences. So I just wanted to share that as well. All right. And um, thank you all for attending tonight as well. I really take all your comments to heart. Thank you. School is out, nothing to report. Thank you. Same thing here, sorry. <laughs> I see that was clean and easy. All right, so we will move to report from the interim superintendent. I will turn it over to Ms. Lee Martin. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to share with the board and, and with the community, the some of you may already be familiar with CSBA's Golden Bell Award. Uh, the award promotes excellence in education. And although we have several programs that uh, are worthy of this award, uh, cabinet um, has determined that we will be nominating the Santa Margarita Academy program. Um, for the under the category of alternative education, I believe Ms. McBride and Mr. Favela were able to see that program when we went on one of the site visits, and it's a very special program that we're really proud of. Dr. Husing and Mr. Rodriguez are working on the application that needs to be submitted by June 30th, and I just wanted to read a brief excerpt from the application as part of it. Um, why you know part of why we think it's so special. Um, students in the Fallbrook community are entitled to a high quality, rigorous and developmentally appropriate program that meets their individual academic and social emotional needs. The FUESD Santa Margarita Academy offers an alternative pathway that proactively promotes community engagement, leadership, self-efficacy, supporting students' unique in educational needs and learning styles. The program allows students to build academic proficiency and personal confidence and take ownership of their learning journey to complete not simply the academic requirements of junior high. 
It also prepares them to be confident, compassionate, and courageous students to succeed in high school and make a meaningful contribution to our community. So we'll be submitting that by June 30th, and in August is when the district will be notified if we're a finalist. Um, so that's exciting for us here. And Dr. Goodman that would help us with that. that yes, and my apologies. Dr. Goodman, um, the teacher down there that I believe that you had met, uh, really helped. She does such an amazing job mm -hmm. with those kids. She could get an award herself, but right. she, she does such an awesome job with them. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to share was that this is my last meeting serving as the interim superintendent. And I want to thank the board, the community, my colleagues, our employees, our students and their families, and most of all, my family <laughs> um, for the support, the patience, the understanding over the past seven months. I'm proud of the work that we've done together. I'm grateful for the opportunities that I've had to make closer connections with many of you. Um, I'm looking forward to working with and supporting Ms. Monica <coughs> Hazel. One year ago, if someone would have told me <laughs> that I was gonna lead this district through what I would call one of the most significant transitions <laughs> that we've experienced, I wouldn't have believed them. But um, I do believe everything happens for a reason. And this experience has only made me love this district even more. Uh, thank you, FUESD. It has been an honor to be your proud interim superintendent. Thank you, Mrs. Martin. Okay, that brings us to the first reading, board policy 9323, meeting conduct. We do, we do have comments. Okay, agenda item. Okay. And we're going to get started. Uh, Russell, come on up. Uh, good evening. I want to say that uh, I read through the policy uh, and I liked it. And I think that honestly, as a board, I can see that you guys are, are trying to make things more accessible to the public and give us an opportunity to speak and a little bit of leeway in certain areas. Um, what I would ask is, uh, like the gentleman uh, over here mentioned at uh, the last board meeting, I've watched a lot of video and footage uh, over the last year, um, and I see certain areas where, you know, things aren't necessarily consistent, right? And I think consistency is extremely important, right? Um, because for one, it leads to less animosity amongst the community, um, and two, people know how to plan and what to expect. Um, so though, you know, this there's a new policy coming, I hope that it is Whatever you guys decide on, it is applied firmly across all groups. Um, that's one. Number two, um, when it comes to kind of meeting conduct, when I read through that agenda, sometimes like it, it helps me, but I could have a lot more questions than I than I have answers. So it's really hard for me to plan. So I ask, like, so for instance, in the future, I'm going to be speaking on uh, the item about. Uh, I think certified personnel or some of the hiring, right? But I'm sitting there thinking, you know, what are their job descriptions? You know, are these all new hires or are they rehires? So I have a lot of questions. And I think maybe adding certain things, not to make whoever's job harder than it already is, on there would allow the community to better understand and better plan so that we can provide you our input so you guys can make better decisions. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Michael. All right, uh, board members, I'd just like you to uh, take note and maybe consider some of the observations I made at the last meeting. Um, I believe it was Mrs. McBride. Um, at one point in the meeting, she suggested a remark that, hey, we've had this item we've been discussing for months, and if you've been doing it for months in here, and again, I've been watching board meeting videos from November last November forward. Um, they've been discussing it for months, and then you all went into a discussion that lasted north of 35 minutes. And in that discussion, when it ended, even after all those months she mentioned, and here, anyone who sat through all of them, even you all did not have a consensus of what you wanted. And one of the remarks that was made was uh, by one board member was, I could be okay with two minutes, but if they get three, don't give them more than that. The other thing that struck me was, is that you have a time limit 
that is not div even divisible by three. I glean from that discussion that you could change that. Why not make it 21 minutes per issue or 24 minutes? Because even if six people speak or seven people speak, that seven person, person is only going to get one minute. What I'm trying to point out here or illuminate here is that thoughts of going home, thoughts of the length of meetings should be the last consideration. When you are serving people of this community, they, you should be looking to give them everything they got. You need to, you need to not, um, not uh, reflect on your duties as a board member, but assess your thoughts and opinions about being a board member. Because we come first. You are here for us. You are here for our kids. Personally, I don't see why someone has to talk for one three-minute segment or two. If four people talk and 12 minutes have gone by and there's more, why not allow the gallery? If there's somebody in there to have additional remarks, get back up. Give the 21 minutes. Give the 24 minutes. Or maybe if somebody is getting back up, then maybe stick to the 20 minutes. But again, my sense was that that time limit is something you have the authority to maybe manipulate a little bit. I'm just asking you to consider that when, you, when you're making these decisions because three minutes is not enough. Again, you took north of 35 minutes after discussing it for months and you still didn't have a consensus, consensus at the end of that board meeting. I'm just pointing out the office. Maybe sometimes I'm too much of a simpleton, but that's what I observed and that was I put in my notes. Thank you. And that's it for that item. Thank you. Okay, is there any discussion from the board? Questions, comments? About this item? Board, board policy um, 9323. We don't have to. We can move on. I just wanted to say a couple of things because I I appreciate um, Mrs. Martin's putting together some draft language for us, and we have talked about this a lot. And I um, wanted to get myself thinking about what my priorities were as I think about that. There are two goals I have. One is maximizing the public's access to the board and its proceedings. And two, and I think these go together, support the efficient consideration of issues and maximize the opportunities to learn about our district through a variety of programs during our board meetings. So on one hand, input, on the other hand, also having a recognition that there are other issues and presentations we want to fit into an agenda, both for the public to hear about what the district is doing and for the board so we can have a chance to hear from our school students or personnel uh, about their perspective. Um, and I know we're going to vote on it the next time. Um, there are a couple of things in here I think are terrific. The remote participation, completing a form eight hours prior to our meeting, 20 minute um, a public comments request 30 minutes prior to the start of open session rather than the general meeting itself. I still have concerns about the issue of unlimited time for public input on any single agenda item, which could run us an hour and a half. So um, I look forward to our taking a vote on this at the next meeting. Any comments? I want to thank uh, Cindy for helping us work this out and helping us move this forward. Um, and uh, it's I, I like what I'm seeing here. Uh, we definitely need to maximize opportunities for the public to give comment and um, be as welcoming as we can. Um, so I, I like what I'm seeing here so far. Um, I do want to clear up uh, any notion that um, if there was any impression that you know there's a just an urgency just to get out of here <laughs> um, as soon as possible. I mean. Uh, I think that's a bit of, I just want to clear that up. I, you know, um, of course, we're here to serve the public and the public deserves the right to speak on the issues. And um, so I'm all for that. I've been on the other, <laughs> other side of the table um, as well. So I very much understand and, and appreciate that. Um, you know, I've always talked about just having efficient meetings and efficient meetings doesn't necessarily mean that we limit comment from the public. It means that we show up here ready to um, you know, uh, take a vote on matters and be uh, to the point on our concerns and questions. Um, so that's that's what I've been talking about in terms of efficiency. 
and I'm gonna, you know, and it's what we owe to the public, right? So we don't spend um, uh, more time than we need to on an item, um, so we can get our business done in a timely manner as well. Um, I, you know, I'm always keeping in mind that there's staff here that have been here in the morning, um, and they're gonna show up tomorrow morning as well. <laughs> um, so it's it's a balance here, but definitely we need to be uh, a board that's open to the public and the comments. So I'm gonna like what I'm seeing here. Mm -hmm. All right, that moves us to second reading and adoption board policy 6158 independent study. It is recommended the governing board adopt board policy 6158 independent study as presented. Do I have a motion to approve? I would like to say something. Please. You have to so have, have a motion first. Oh. I have a motion to approve. Thank you. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, this was originally adopted in 3-1 of 2005, it was revised in 9-1 of 2022. We are looking at the one that we're looking at is the 9 of 22, correct? The draft there should be what we would want it to be. So, so I, don't, I don't believe that's the- Either one of those. It's not the original, it's not the revised of, if that's the one, I'm, I'm trying to look at your screen to see what you're looking at. Is that the one that was attached to the agenda? Yes. Then that is what the proposal would be. And once it's adopted, then the dates would change to say when, you know, that was the last time that it was changed. So then if it was adopted tonight, it would then say adopted with June 20th, 2023. And this is the one that I asked if we could get what the differences are. Um, because we're not able to tell what are what what are we adding what are we subtracting so because i don't have that information we don't have that information i ask that we table this until that information is provided i would um just like to offer this actually came about at the recommendation of our um, independent auditors who have come in and done an audit of our independent study program and what they found was that there were some changes made to the law having to do with the time of COVID and what had to happen there. And this needs to be done by June 30th so we don't lose funding is, is really what it comes down to. It's a technicality. I'll also tell you that there's new law effective July 1, 2023. So this, you know, it, it's, it's a technicality. The year's already over. We've already run the program. This was a piece that they kept at Sacramento kept changing what the rules and the laws were regarding independent study. So I don't want to discount what you're asking, Ms. McBride. I'm just saying in this case, if it's tabled, then the district would lose funds. Okay, so we we got it so late. It would, there's no time to, to have extra information, details on this. Is this, this is what I understand. Our auditors were just here in, at the end of May, I believe, that we're doing the audit for looking back. And that was actually early for them. They usually don't come until the fall, but as a preliminary check to make sure everything was in compliance. So that's why we needed to get it done this month. But I did share your uh, request with Ms. Hazel moving forward on how the board or you would like to see um, proposed changes to the um, board policies. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, I'll call for the vote. Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Mr. Favela? Aye. Ms. McBride? No. And I will vote aye as well. Motion passes. <clears throat> that moves us to information ending fund balances. That moves us on to adoption of 2023-2024 budget. It is recommended the governing board adopt the district's 2023-2024 budget and 2022-23 estimated actuals. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Comments? All right. Call for the vote. Ms. Ball? Aye. It's not for public. Thank you. Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Ms. Drew Favela? Aye. Ms. McBride? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion passes. That moves us to action. We do have a comment for item 4.2. Okay. Thank you. What any did 
sorry, I did, you did have a card for that one as well. I'm sorry about that. Okay, thank you. It's a different order. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Maybe we could slow it down a little bit. <laughs> uh, really, what I wanted to talk about is uh, crunch, a, crunch a few numbers, kind of go back to, to how the military affects the budget here. And please, Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're a lot smarter than me on this, right? But uh, local funds, right, which are uh, property taxes that fund the districts around $20 million, right? Um, $13,897 per student in the district, right? That is the goal to reach. That is a lot more than $20 million, right? So the state subsidizes the rest. Um, military kids, the 1,312 of us, we also get that uh, $13,897 a piece. But then on top of that, we do estimated taxes for base. Uh, and you guys get impact funds around $6 million, right? Which is actually on top of that. That's not less money that the state has to pay. That's on top of what you already get from the military being here. Um, and then you count on the 80% the of the funding for San Onofre Elementary School, which the district would have had to have paid, right? But uh, Department of Defense Education Activity paid for 80% of it. The same thing with uh, Mary Faye Pendleton. I probably messed up that, that name. Um, so I just want everybody to understand the fact that the, the, the military here brings this district a lot of money a lot more than non-military kids, not to say that our kids are more important, I'm not saying that at all, right? But I'm just talking about representation here. I think it's about uh, almost $20,000 a kid uh, uh, for, for the military students. Um, and once again, this kind of comes down to the fact of, of representation, okay? So please do not discount uh, what the military not only brings to the school district, but also really the community as a whole, because I'm sure a lot of businesses count on military folks spending money, um, which is why they can stay here, which is why their kids can go to school here, et cetera. Et cetera. So I just kind of wanted to break down those numbers a little bit. Thank you. Okay, now I lost the list. Do we, we all the cards, did we? We did have a card from Russell for, for 6.1. Oh no, okay, we're not there yet, sorry. Okay. Right. Okay, so we got our motion, we got our second, but we didn't vote, correct, Stephanie? Uh, you did vote. You did vote. Okay, so we're on action. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're on action resolution number 14-2223, resolution regarding the education protection account. It is recommended the governing board adopt resolution number 14-2223, resolution regarding the education protection account. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. A second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right. Call for the vote. Ms. Sabal. Aye. Ms. Lindine. Aye. Mr. Favela. Aye. Ms. McBride. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving to four action annual fiscal resolutions for the 2023 2024 school year. It is recommended the governing board approve the listed resolution. So I have a motion to approve. Motion approved. Thank you. Second. I second. Thank you. No discussion. Call for the vote. Ms. Saval. Aye. Ms. Lundin. Aye. Mr. Favela. Aye. Ms. McBride. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Thank you. Moving us now to educational services number one, information presentation, annual report, California dashboard, local indicators. And I'll turn it over to Mrs. Martin. And I'm going to be turning it over to Dr. Husing, who's going to make um, a presentation. This presentation is required uh, to be made, just like the LCAP had the public hearing and the presentation at the last meeting. It's required that this be done separately. And um, I will tell you that the I don't want to say the wording, but sometimes it can be a little misleading because it'll say uh, perhaps approval of. And this really is the board's acceptance of because this is data and statistics and so the numbers are what they are but this is um, actually kind of certifying that this event took place mm -hmm. at a regularly scheduled meeting on the agenda 
for the public and that they could comment. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hussein. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so this evening, I have the pleasure to explain how we are meeting the local indicators here in the Fallbrook Union Elementary School District. So good evening, uh, President Dr. McRae, board members, my fellow cabinet members, and members of the Fallbrook community joining us this evening. So the purpose of this presentation on behalf of Ed Services and the schools um, is to present our local performance indicators. This report has been prepared in reflection of the practices here in Fallbrook and in accordance with the State Board of Education approved standards of appropriate priority areas. So all local education agencies, so for example, Fallbrook Union Elementary School District are required, we are all required to do the following, annually measure our progress uh, according to the priorities, and then report them at a board meeting. That's what we're doing tonight. And then sending that report to the State Board of Education. And then once that is once so those three things are done, then we have met our requirements. And then the information is published in the dashboard. So in California K-8 schools, we report on four state indicators. So we don't report on college. Uh, attendance or graduation rates. Um, and then in the academic indicators for the state requirements are broken into two categories, both English language arts and math. And that is why we talk about student progress in English language arts and math. Those are the required um, state requirements. But K-8 reports also on five local indicators. So you'll see that on the right-hand side of this um, graphic. So state indicators are color-coded and the local indicators are reported as either standard met, or standard not met. State indicators are, are hard data. That's the SBAC scores, it's attendance, it's suspension rates, it's chronic absenteeism. Um, but the state or our local indicators, that's soft data. That's our surveys, it's perception data, and teacher input. Each year, the district is required to look at that soft data and use a reflective tool to assess how we are doing in these areas and then set goals accordingly. That is the way we meet the indicator. So California's accountability and continuous improvement system is an online tool that displays the performance of local education agencies, LEAs, again, Fallbrook, and student groups in a set of state and local measures to assist in identifying strengths, challenges, and areas of need for improvement. So just as a little bit of a review, as you know, the dashboard was actually paused for two years during COVID, and then it came back this year as a static display. Um, and then next year, it will display our student results and our indicators that happened this year. It will display it next year, and it will be a growth progress monitoring. So this is what the report looked like back in 2018-19, and it was actually reflecting the 17-18 school year. And these are the color codings. And you remember the dashboard is measurement of progress year over year. So for example, the chronic absenteeism was in green, meaning that there wasn't very much chronic absenteeism and the district improved from the year prior. That's how you stay in either green or blue. You have to maintain and improve. And then this is what the dashboard shows this year. So this is a static display of the standards and the local indicators from one year only. That's why it's purple. So again, there's color because it's reflected year over year. And then it was a reset after COVID. And so it's a static display and it's one color only. But you'll notice the local indicators there are met. Okay, so I'm pleased to describe that in Fallbrook, we have met all of the local indicators. And again, we have to conduct the self-assessment and then we report the results. So we'll get into the standards. What are they? So the priority number one is basic services and conditions. And so this is just a summary from the report that was provided to you uh, and attached to the agenda for this evening that Fallbrook has appropriately assigned teachers, provides access to standards aligned instructional materials, and maintains safe and clean and functional school facilities. So all of that is under priority one. Oh, sorry. Brian, you forgot to pass out the papers. Oh, they, did. They, were, they, were they were collected. They were here. They were we collected. had them. Oh, very good. 
<laughs> awesome. Okay. No, I was looking for it going. I could have sworn it was no worries. Thanks. Okay. I was wondering, what are you guys passing around there? <laughs> okay. So now we're going on to priority two. Again, Fallbrook has met that priority. And this is the implementation of state academic standards. We are required as a California public school district to implement the state implement the state standards and Fallbrook annually measures our student progress on implementing the state's academic standards. Okay, we're going to move on to priority three. Priority three is parent engagement. And I know I spend a lot of time in the LCAP presentation explaining how much parental engagement we have, not only from surveys and LCAP meetings, but also from you know, parent outreach, the coffees with the principal, the events in the evening, tying in our ELO program, and of course, back to school night and open house events. Uh, we also have this year uh, reached out to parents to include um, participating in community events like Fallbrook a la and the Avocado Festival and Arts in the Park. Those are community activities that the Fallbrook Union Elementary School District joins in and helps along with. So we annually measure our progress in number one, building relationships between the schools and our families, building partnerships uh, for student outcomes and building partnerships within the community, and also seeking input from parents so that we can make appropriate decisions. Moving on to priority six, uh, this is school climate. And we spend a lot of time understanding school climate, the trends, and that's because we know if students are healthy and happy at school, they can be the best learners possible. So FUSD administers local school climate surveys every year that provide valid measure of perceptions of school safety and connectedness, such as our Panorama Student Wellness Survey and the California Healthy Kids Survey. So notably, um, we did surveys also for parents and students, and my favorite response was that students feel safe at school and parents feel their students are safe at school. So our district summarized the data um, by grade span, and then we share that data during our LCAP engagement sessions. So we are able to present that when the principals hold the engagement sessions, and then it's useful data when we are talking about what our goals should be and not to include. And then moving on to priority seven, FUSD measures um, a broad course of study. So we measure this progress to the extent to which our students have access to and are enrolled in a broad course of study. That includes our adopted courses and the study of specific California educa education code that's required. But we also offer extension and choice in elementary programs. And we're really proud of the broad course of study that includes schools of choice like our Fallbrook STEM Academy, like May Ellis Dual Immersion Program, and of course the Fallbrook Virtual Academy. Again, I've, I've mentioned this before, and um, when, you have, um, when you are in a district like Fallbrook and we have so many options, it's easy to say, well, that's just how it's done, but it's not done that way in many districts, and that's very unique for a small district like us to have so many options. We've also been able to include advancement for students in seventh and eighth grade. And I think if you participated in any of the promotion ceremonies, you saw our students who have completed their first year of high school math. So then when they go to high school, they get to advance to the next level of math. We're really excited about that. And that concludes our presentation. Of course, we have met the indicators and I appreciate your time and I'm available for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that moves us to adoption 2021 through 2024 local control accountability plan. It is recommended the governing board approve the 2021 to 2024 local control accountability plan, also known as the LCAP. Do I have a motion to approve? I so move. Thank you. Second. No second. Thank you. Comment. All right, I'll call for the vote. Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Mr. Favela? Aye. Ms. McBride? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion passes. On to adoption 2023-2024. Local control and accountability, LCAP LEA, federal addendum. It is recommended the governing board adopt the 2023-2024 local control and accountability plan, LCAP LEA, federal addendum. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Discussion. All right. Call for the vote. 
Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Mr. Favela? Aye. Ms. McBride? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion passes. On to item six, consent agenda. It is recommended the governing board approve the consent agenda as presented. I do have a comment right. on this one. And it was from Russell. Russell, step on up. Hello, uh, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier when I was looking through it, and it was kind of a list of new employees, it seemed like, uh, social workers, uh, school counselors, et cetera, and the other one had like bus drivers and and, and other stuff. Um, and I guess my concern is, is uh, so for instance, with the presentation you just gave, ma'am, uh, I looked at those hard numbers, which showed low for math, low for ELA, and then I see that we're spending all this extra money on social workers. And I see one of them is supposed to go to San Onofre uh, Elementary School. And I look at that and, you know, there's no job description for him. But I think to myself, what does a social worker do? And why would a social worker need to be at San Onofre Elementary School? And maybe there are certain areas in the district that I'm not tracking on where maybe that would be more appropriate. But I feel like it's a little bit overkill. And, uh, you know, for me, like if, if, a, if a child is having an issue, Right. They, they go to see the school counselor, school counselors kind of there. And then if they find out that something, you know, immoral, unethical or illegal is going on at that point, they could contact, you know, uh, other resources, the county, et cetera, who would then handle those issues. But uh, the idea that we're adding all of these social workers and I might be off base because I don't know if they're new or if we're adding new ones because I'm just confused because it wasn't clear in the agenda. But if we're adding new social workers, do we already have social workers? I don't know. Do we need more? Why would it be appropriate for one to be at San Onofre Elementary School? None of the 500 uh, military kids that go there uh, are homeless, right? There are also other programs, you know, within the Marine Corps for parents to be held responsible to their kids, so on and so forth. So I kind of feel like that's a waste of resource, better put towards making our kids better at math, better at ELA. Um, and then like, I just... Uh, I'm not very trusting these days. So I don't necessarily know what a social worker is going to be doing. If I'm going to be told as a father, if my daughter is talking or one of my children is talking to a social worker, what they're trying to do, so on and so forth, right? Because maybe, I don't know, things are crazy these days. I don't necessarily understand all of them, right? But I'm just really uncomfortable with it. And I hope you guys consider that as maybe this is a waste of a resource, we could be putting that money elsewhere to actually help the kids instead of checking a box. So thank you very much. Comments or discussion? Am I right that because this is an agenda item that we can respond to a public comment? I think I, I think that is part of our policy that if someone's speaking about something that's on the agenda, and the Brown Act allows a response. And I think that's a fair question. I'm not the right person to answer it, but I wonder if someone on the staff would like to just briefly explain the value of our social workers, the need for our social workers, and um, why we might have one on base. Mm -hmm. I can definitely provide additional information in a Friday report coming up, but I think it's also important to answer this um, plainly um, at this time. So when we are talking about the business that happens at a school, it is very different than what happens in maybe a doctor's office or um, or a city social worker situation that maybe works with um, child protective services. At a school campus, um, counselors work uh, in a school setting. So they work on student um, success in um, their classwork, in social skills and career um, choices, so career tech, so that they know what kind of um, things they want to study. So that's really the counselor role. And there's a, a whole association and a set of uh, standards that the school counselors meet. And uh, the school counselors will help with our tier one or our everybody gets tier um, support of our character development program. And they support that school wide. So one counselor for the school, whole school, and they support going in to do lessons in the classroom and then support the school wide goals for 
how students behave on the playground and how we mitigate um, problems moving forward. A social worker works kind of dovetailed hand in hand with the school, but in a different realm. Um, there are students who require what we call tier three source resources. So remember that tier one is everybody gets and tier three is a very few amount of students. But if you have spent any time in the principal's office, you spend principals spend most of their time with maybe like five or 10 percent of the school population because those are the students that bring the highest need. And every school has high need students. Um, in every one of our schools across the district. And these are um, maybe situations where health is involved. And so there needs to be a connection between the family and, and the community um, being able to support with resources. This is our wraparound way to help students who are maybe averse to attending school and finding out what are the, um, what are the roadblocks that are getting in the way of a child being able to come to school. Um, sometimes there are social emotional issues that we need to deal with. Um, finding parenting support for parents and community resources for parents. And um, there are a lot of resources for our students on base as they are needed because they are students with an extra layer of um, challenges that their families will go through, not only with deployment, but also moving very often, adjusting to school and things like that. Um, and I th I've heard also in these meetings, you know, our parents involved with when students engage with counselors or social workers, and they absolutely are. The tier one, everybody gets, it's the uh, character development program and leadership strategies that um, we've all talked about with leader in me and uh, character strong. Um, with social workers, if, if a social worker is working one-on-one -on -one with a student, it's because a parent called and asked for the help or a teacher has reached out to a parent and then they haven't been able to make contact. So then the social worker is making contact with the family. So it's all in the open and we're, we are seeking that connection with families. Um, I think when you are looking at our reports and our practices, we are explaining how deeply connected we are with families and that all is um, a necessary part. We can't do it without our family support. The, the kids need everyone, right? The parents, the teachers, the staff, and um especially their family, their, their extended family even sometimes. So I would like the opportunity to um, come back with a presentation at, at a board meeting in the future to discuss more in detail. And um, Mr. Rodriguez will be great at this. We could have a counselor come, we could have a social worker come, um, and we can explain from the administrative point about how these programs dovetail with each other. And I think I explained at the last board meeting um, Mr. Rodriguez, can you help me with the number? Um, we conduct what is called a student risk assessment when a child um, has made plans or we discover a child has plans to hurt themselves. And in our small district of 5,000 students, it was 121 student risk assessments. And those are not, you know, I don't like this color blue on my paper. It's uh, when students truly have a plan to hurt themselves. And that's what I was explaining we have so many great things going on. We have amazing families. We have, it's not for a lack of um, a wonderful opportunity and great schools, but there are children who are who are going through some personal items. And again, we want children to be successful in school. And if they're not healthy, happy in school, then they, they're not able to do their best learning. So that's what that extra support is. Um, and when we have those high needs, I was explaining, I was a first grade teacher when I was in the classroom. Well, I had 32 other little students. And if I was up in the office making the phone calls while the rest, what were the other 31 students going to be doing in class? So that's why we have these supports. Um, and we wouldn't bring that unless we had the data, the needs, and then the actual um, system support to integrate those staff members. They're not just, you know, um, we're not adding them without intentionality, they are part of our student success services teams on each campus. I hope I didn't give the impression that I don't support our, no. our school because I think that's one of the things that we do extremely well that we, and, and the data clearly shows nationally mm -hmm. that children won't learn unless their social and emotional needs are being attended to if they have them. And, you know, most kids at some point in their academic career run into issues, whether it's the divorce of a parent or whatever it might be. Um, and I think this school district does an outstanding job 
of dealing with the the whole student. Um, so I just didn't want to. I just oh, didn't no. feel I had the information to exactly answer the question. But you do very well, and so we'd love to have a presentation. But I don't want to add more work to you during the summer months. Oh well, that's okay. I think it would be helpful because there are those questions. Well, what are they going to do, and where are they going to be, and how are they an integral part of the team? Um, and it's new. I would say Fallbrook is a little bit forward thinking uh, to be able to address concerns be before they become. Um, tragedies mm -hmm. yeah could you answer to the public um how many i think that was part of the question how many um social workers and psychologists counselors we have at this at this point okay in this so i can answer the social workers we have four social workers currently with one um who are spread out among the sites and then we have one district social worker so if we go back a couple of years uh, there was one social worker for the whole district and then it was in the lcap plan approved last year to add a social worker per each site but we simply couldn't hire them because they didn't exist um, there weren't enough because of all of the social concerns so we we couldn't recruit them it has taken a year to recruit them and we're very excited that um we have now a full with the approval of this item then we'll have the full team going into next year so this had already been the plan um, and we have been working together to to meet student needs um, without having the full team um, but so that in total to answer your question it would be one for each school and then a district social worker and then the district social worker would also support santa margarita academy and the virtual school um, so the counselors and the okay how many counselors we have one counselor at each of our elementary sites we have two counselors at potter junior high and two counselors um at sano and mary Fay. and psychologists okay i'm gonna have to go off of memory i think is it 10 nine one added for next year thank you my team in the uh, gallery helping me out so and psychologists in the educational setting are truly to assist with special ed so that's why um the uh, my special ed team back here is answering because they're part of the special education um evaluation of students so there are education psychoeducational assessments that each child that enters into special ed are given and then every triennial so every three years they're reassessed um, and so our psychologists across the district have a caseload and caseloads are anywhere between 90 and 120 students on each of their caseloads um, and so they meet with the students annually they participate in the students annual individual education plan meeting and then they prepare, give and prepare those assessments and reports for eligibility for special education okay so what i'm counting is five social workers 11 counselors and 10 psychologists and that's the the information that i got so um so and we're being asked to add three more social workers and two more counselors Okay, so the added counselors are one is, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think one is to cover a year long leave. Well, I, I just to clarify, um, the social workers and the counselors are not additional new positions. These are vacant positions that were um, budgeted all of this past school year and not completely filled. And then part of the LCAP and moving forward. So they're, they were vacant, they were never filled, but I wouldn't necessarily call them ads because the intention was that each school would always have one we just couldn't find them um the the ad is the psychologist mm -hmm. which i know can sound a little daunting like psycho but it's a completely different psychology service my son saw that for when he was assessed for speech and to make sure there was no other learning disability going on and that was it so that that was the extent of the psychology work there um the the counselors that we have again those are existing positions that either these are i don't know off the top of my head but either are replacements for people that have left or in this case we have one counselor who's on a military leave mm -hmm. and to so to be supportive of that mm -hmm. that he needs to be granted his leave but the school then is without a counselor during that time and we have a couple of maternity leaves um but they're not necessarily 
additional. It's almost like having a substitute teacher for somebody that's out. It's just so highly specialized that they get added for that period of time versus a day-to-day -day person. And I do remember reading that for the counselors, they were replacing one military leave and one uh, maternity. Uh, maternity leave. Right, right. The social workers are, but the social workers, I understand, are new additions. There, at least there, there was, we yes. have five five social workers and these would be added. So a total of eight. This social past workers. year, the social workers had to split their assignment. So instead of one at a school, they were, you know, 50% at this school, 50% or uh, I shouldn't say 50, 50, but they were split between multiple school sites. So this is again, to have the one at each school site that was included in the budget at the beginning of this past year. Um, and as Dr. Husing explained, and I believe the job descriptions are on our website, aren't they? So I think the job descriptions for all of these are on the district's website under human resources. So they're accessible to the public. Um, but again, I think, I think education needs to kind of keep up with the times because we hear social worker and think there's a problem that involves child protective services or some of the other concerns that somebody might have. And it's a different role it's not that same, a child's being abused and we need you know, a social worker coming in and intervening. Um, but again, this would just get us st staff to where we had hoped to be this time last year. Um, but they are new people that are being added into existing vacant positions. Mm -hmm. One other point is that I have checked with other districts that are much bigger than ours and they don't have this many. So combination of social workers, counselors, and psychiatrists. So the question is why our small district needs so many where that money could be used for my point or my point before in the past has been, why can't we take some of this money and instead put it towards making, um, uh, bringing in maybe teacher assistants to help during school, uh, more information, more um, academic stuff to, to build up the academics that is so low in our district for the students. Money, we, money is huge here, a hundred million dollar budget. And yet we still don't have children proficient as I pointed out at the last meeting, even according to your um, presentation, Dr. Husing, we're still under 50th percentile, even though we went up maybe seven points here, eight points there. It still was in, for math, if I remember correctly, it was anywhere between 20% and 30 some percent for um, e, uh, EL was like four, uh, 30 some percent to 40 some percent, still under 50th percentile. So for me, I would like to see that kind of money put towards getting those academics up, the math and the reading. Pri pri priority to me is the reading because even with the math, a lot of them are word problems. So mm -hmm. it, it, they have to be proficient in reading. And from statistics, we understand that if children are not proficient by third grade, they are, they are behind. They either take them a long time or they may never catch up. Mm -hmm. so. so I certainly wouldn't want this to sound like a blanket statement, but I think this is one part of a strategy to know that if the student is not reading, what's the reason behind it? Um, is it as simple as hiring a, an aide in the classroom or you know additional intervention support? Because we certainly do. We do have a ton of intervention support as well at our schools. But is there something more that it's the work and the specialist of a social worker or a counselor to help identify the issue that's really the root cause why they're not learning to read by third grade if that's the problem or you know their math scores aren't where they need to be. Um, this is a part of the big, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to how to solve the problem. I think it's multi-layered and a combination of, of several different things. Um, again, I don't know the districts that are their size and I would say that they were probably in the same boat we were in, which was they couldn't find the people. Didn't mean they didn't want them or they didn't have the positions there. They just simply couldn't find them. Having said that, this is what's in the LCAP, which you all just approved. And so, and that's really comes majority from the parent engagement and, and what the, the parents and community have said that they want for their kids in addition to the other things that we provide. So 
for what that's worth. And we can schedule a, a presentation mm -hmm. to be more clear and more descriptive about what it is that um, the social workers are helping with and how that then provides the classroom more focused time for the instruction. All right, call for the vote. This we need motion. Oh, we didn't do the vote. Oh, sorry. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll move. Thank you. Second. I'll second. Yeah. All right. Ms. Lund or Ms. Sabal. Aye. Ms. Lundin. Aye. Mr. Cavella. Aye. Ms. McBride. Aye. And I vote as well. Item passes. And that brings us to the adjournment at 7.07. 07.